we have, over the past few Sunday nights, aside from when I've been away, been going through the Old Testament and showing you how to sort of have an overview of the Scriptures. And uh, for those of you that, in case you didn't get a copy of it, I made a few more copies because we ran out the last time, and I'll put them down here on the communion table. There's only about 10 there, so if you want one, you need to go get it right away. And you can grab it right now if you want to get one. So, uh, I was going to say these are my notes for tonight that I'll be preaching from, but uh, that's not really true. Last time we were together, we talked about the dispensations, and a couple of people said, could you put that together in a few notes for us as well? So I made that available. There's only about 15, 20 copies of that here. If we run out, we can get a Lynn to make us some more, but those are available there. If, if you're interested in that, I think it would be helpful to you at all. So I'm, I'm going to take a few minutes tonight just to go through the Old Testament walkthrough. Remember, we do in about 10, 10 minutes, we cover the entire Old Testament. So we'll go through that and form a basis for where I want to go with you tonight in our study. So if you've been through that and you, you got it all memorized, you know, you can help me out when I mess up. But starting through the Old Testament, we just cover the first few chapters of Genesis, so you get that in your mind. Genesis chapter 1, story of creation. Chapter 2 is special events in creation. Chapter 3 is temptation and fall of Adam and Eve. And chapter 4 is Cain killed Abel. Genesis chapter 5 is genealogies. Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8 is Noah and the flood. Chapters 9 is Noah. After the flood, chapter 10 is genealogies again. Chapter 11 is the building of the Tower of Babel and rebellion against God. Chapter 11 is the call of Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers flow into the Persian Gulf. That's modern-day Iraq. So uh, you got that down. Everybody got that? Then God called Abraham and told him to go to a land that he would show him. Didn't know where he was going, but he went about 400 miles north uh, west up across to the, the Fertile Crescent, up to a place called Iran, where his father died. Then he comes about 600 miles down across the Fertile Crescent into the land of Canaan. When he gets there, he's got a problem because he doesn't have any children. Abraham went into his handmaid, whose name was Hagar, and he had a son whose name was Ishmael, but God said, Ishmael's not the son of promise. He's not the one that the promise is going to be fulfilled through, that uh, God had made certain promise to Abraham about land and seed and blessings in chapter 12 of Genesis. And so he says, no, he's not the son of promise. Finally has a son to his wife, whose name was? Pardon? Sarah. There was hesitancy there. His name was Sarah, and that son's name was Isaac. Isaac was the son of promise. Isaac had two sons. They were twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau was not the son of promise, but Jacob was the son of promise. And then Jacob had 12 sons, and the second youngest of those sons, whose name was Joseph, you know, was sold into slavery down and bondage down into Egypt, slave to Potiphar, put into prison, and then rose to promise, become second in the land. And ultimately, Jacob and all the other uh, brothers, the tribes of Israel, came down into the land of Egypt where they lived for about the next 400 years. And at the end of that time, they were in severe bondage. And you remember that the people cried out to God, and God came and called Moses out of Midian and said, Midian, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses comes over and says, Pharaoh, let my, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no, it's not going to happen. So God performs a series of plagues and miracles against the Egyptians until the point comes where Pharaoh says, okay, get out of here. They get together and... Uh, begin to leave the land. They come down to the Red Sea. God parts the waters of the Red Sea. They go across on dry land. Pharaoh and his armies follow them. They get drowned. They go over to Mount Sinai where they got something we've been learning about on Sunday mornings called the Ten Commandments. And they were another covenant with God. And so they enter into the Ten Commandments. They go from Mount Sinai, wander for a couple of years, get over to a place called Kadesh Barnea on the borders of the Promised Land where they send in the 12 spies. And two of the spies came back and said, it's a good land, we can take it, God will give it to us. Ten of them came back and said, no, there's giants in the land, we can't take it. The people voted and said no, and God says, because you rebelled and refused to do what I tell you to do, 
everybody that's 20 years and older, think about that, if that was everybody 20 years and older here tonight, how many would make it into the promised land? Not very many. Everybody that's under 20 was going to make it into the land. Over 20 was going to die in the wilderness. We said that amounted to about 83 funerals every single day for the next 38 years as they wandered in the wilderness. And then they come... Uh, back to the borders, and Moses goes up into Mount Pisgah, looks over, sees the land, he dies. Joshua becomes the leader, takes them across the Jordan River to Jericho, conquer Jericho, you know that story. Uh, they conquer the land, defeat the nations that were there, and Joshua divides the land, and then Joshua dies. And for the next 350 years, they're ruled over by a group of men that were called judges, that God raised up at specific times. And the, <clears throat> the period of Judges, which I said was 350 years long, during that time there are about seven times where Israel went up and down and up and down, spiritually, socially, economically. They, they would rebel against God, go into sin. God would bring in a pagan nation to put them into bondage. They would cry out to God. God would deliver them through a judge. While the judge was alive, generally they followed the Lord and then they forgot the Lord and went back to the same old business. Did that about seven times until finally the people said, we don't want a judge to rule over us. We want a king like all the other nations. And the last of the judges, whose name was Samuel. Samuel anoints the first king. His name was Saul. And then we have the second king, whose name was David. And the third king, whose name was Solomon. And for that period of time, there was a, a unified kingdom. At the end of that time, the nation of Israel becomes divided. There were 10 tribes of Israel that formed the northern kingdom and two tribes that formed the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was known as Israel. Southern kingdom was known as Judah. The capital of the north was Samaria. When you're reading in the Bible and through the kings and so on, uh, this will help you to really keep that straight if you'll keep this in mind. When you're thinking about Samaria, the northern kingdom, when it's called Israel, 10 tribes in the north. In the south, the southern kingdom was called Judah. The capital was Jerusalem. And uh, during that time, they were ruled over by the kings in the land of Israel. And they went on until the northern kingdom, until 722 B.C., when Shalmaneser and the Assyrians came over, and they carried those ten northern tribes into captivity. And basically, there's not a lot heard from them after that. And then the southern kingdom went on until 606 B.C., until Nebuchadnezzar came over because of the rebellion of the Israelites and failure to keep God's laws. And they were carried into captivity in Babylon where they were in captivity for 70 years. Down there at the end of that 70 years, God defeated the Babylonians through the Persians. Cyrus makes a decree that they can rise up and take a group of people back to the land. And you remember that Ezra uh, led about 50,000 of them back to the land. And the purpose of that was to rebuild the temple reestablished temple worship for the, the children of Israel. And then another man came along and assisted with what was going on there. His name was Nehemiah. Nehemiah, remember, came back and he rebuilt built the walls, built the houses, reestablished the temple worship, and that is the chronological end of the Old Testament. So if you get that in your head, everything in the Old Testament fits within that and will help you to keep things simplified and understanding the Old Testament. So uh, if you haven't got a copy of that, please help yourself to a copy and and I would encourage you to memorize that. It's not that hard. If, if this old guy can do it, you, you can do it, right? And it will help you greatly in understanding the Scriptures. And we're talking about how to study the Bible. We're talking about uh, observation. But then we started to talk about the interpretation of the Scriptures. Well, interpretation, it requires that you have a proper understanding of the events and how they're taking and uh, place and how they fit in and all of that. So this will help you with the interpretation of the Scriptures. And, uh, and then the last time we were together, we began to talk about the different covenants that are there in the Old Testament, which are very important to understand. There was the covenant that God made with Abraham, which is reiterated. It's given in chapter 12. It's reiterated in chapters uh, 13, 15, and 17, and then some more things again in chapter 22 of Genesis. But uh, that's the Abrahamic covenant. And it's about God's going to give them a land. Uh, he's going to give them a seed pointing forward to the Messiah, first promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and then further details to, to, uh, Jer to uh, Jeremiah, to uh, Abraham here in Genesis chapter 12 and following chapters. And we said there's a, 
a Palestinian covenant that you'll find in Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29, and 30. There's the Mosaic covenant, which had to do with the law. There's, uh, had a brain freeze, but the, the covenant that God made with David, and the covenant with David really uh, made and clarified, I think, a lot about what God was talking about, the coming of the Messiah, and he had to specifically come from the line of David to be able to sit on his throne and carry on his kingdom forever. So there's the promise of Messiah, and then the details keep narrowing it in. So he's got to come from this group of people. It's got to come from this line, and so on. He's got to come from the line of David. And, uh, and then there's one more covenant there, and it's the covenant that God gives to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, down around verses 31 through 34, where he talks about that I'm going to put within man a new heart. You know, they didn't have that at that point, right? But God said, I'm going to do a new thing. And he promises us this new covenant. And you remember when Jesus came, he said, you've been sort of living under that old covenant, the law and all of that, but I'm going to make a new covenant. And the new covenant in his what? In his blood. That's when he hung on the cross. He in, was instituting the new covenant. We sometimes call it the covenant of grace. I don't know if that's the best title for it, but I know that we are saved by grace, by the grace of God. But what I want you to understand, way back in the Old Testament, even Abraham, Abraham wasn't saved by keeping the law because they didn't have the law. Abraham was saved how? Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, just like you believe God and it's counted unto you to righteousness, based upon the Messiah. Abraham looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. You and I look back to the fact that that Messiah has come. His name is Jesus and offered himself on the cross, bled and died for us, raised on the third day, and all that. We won't go there uh, tonight just because of time. The fulfillment of that new covenant, you know it's getting close. When you get into Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 and 2, and you're reading about, Bob sang about it tonight, had us sing all those Christmas songs. What were we singing about? We're singing about this baby, this son of God that came into this world to be our redeemer, to be the Messiah, the anointed one of God that was sent for us. And Mary sings praises to him. And Elizabeth and Zechariah, they sing praises to God. And uh, those er opening chapters of the Gospels are full of that glorious truth. Tonight, I want you to take your Bibles and come first of all to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And just kind of spend a few minutes here tonight tracing what happens in the Gospels. And we're going to stick pretty much to the Gospel of Matthew to help us to do that and, and not to confuse you, hopefully, too much. Now, I've taken the time to go through the Old Testament and talk about the covenants because when Israel talked about the blessings of God, and they talked about the promises of God and the covenants of God, they knew what they were talking about. So when the, the, they talked about the promises of God, what were they looking for? They were looking for a throne. They were looking for a, a kingdom and somebody to sit upon that throne and to make the nation of Israel great. And so when the preachers in the New Testament began to talk about the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what were they thinking? Heavenly kingdom or earthly kingdom? Earthly kingdom, because their promises were earthly. When we talk about the promises that God makes to the church, they're primarily spiritual promises, right? But with Israel, it was, was earthbound to some extent. Not that they weren't looking to heaven, but, but they were, were promises about a kingdom and a throne and a nation that God was going to give them. And when they talked about a kingdom, it was something that you could picture and see. When we talk about the kingdom today, the kingdom of heaven, what, what is that? It's a little bit nebulous, isn't it? It's, it's hard to put your hands on and hold on to, right, Bob? It's, is, the, is there a kingdom of heaven today? Or is that in the future just kind of pie in the sky and someday we're going to be there? But no, we understand we're part of the kingdom of God. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're in the kingdom, but there's not an earthly kingdom that we can look at. There's not a throne that we're looking to to say, okay, over in Jerusalem there, there's a, a throne and a place and all of that. We, we don't have that. So, but when Israel talked about it, what I want you to understand, it was a real place. It was a real thing that, that they were looking to be set up and established uh, for them. Now, in Matthew chapter 2, 
we have the story of the wise men. You all know that? You all know that we have some men here that were not so wise last Christmas? I just had to mention that. I just had to say it. I'm sorry. Not mentioning any names, but Brian or anybody. <coughs> the wise men came from the east, and they came to see King Herod because they were seeking a king. And they said to King Herod, can you tell us, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And, and Herod looks at that and says, what did you say? Because Herod's the king, and he, he doesn't like any competition, right? And so he begins to inquire, and he calls in the, the wise men and the religious leaders and say, okay, I want to know, where is this king of the Jews supposed to be born? And they can tell him. They know that the one that's going to set up the kingdom is to be born where? In Bethlehem of Ephratah. See, there's another Bethlehem, but this is Bethlehem and Ephratah. And, and he says, he's going to be born there according to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. The prophets had prophesied this and a lot of other things about the Messiah that we know from Isaiah and other portions of Scripture, but, but they knew where he was going to be born. And so Herod sends the wise men and says, you go find him and then send me word where he is so I can come and worship him too. And we all know that was not his intent. He wanted to get rid of him. The wise men go, and they, they see Jesus, they worship him, they give him their gifts, and they're going to go back and tell Pharaoh, but God says, don't do it. Don't go tell him. So they go home another way, so Pharaoh can't, or, uh, uh, Herod can't catch up with them. And when Herod realizes that he's been tricked, that's when he says, all right, I'll put a stop to this. And he determines that he's going to kill all the male children that are two years old and younger to prevent this one who's going to lay claim to the throne from taking that throne. So he tries to kill all the male children. You know, that's when Jesus fled uh, with his parents down into Egypt for a period of time and so on. So that's all going on here in what we read in Matthew chapter 2. Uh, along comes John the Baptist. And John the Baptist begins to preach, and boy, could he preach. He <laughs> He is a fiery preacher. What was his message? But you know, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Israel heard that, what did they hear? Oh, there's a spiritual kingdom coming. No, they heard what? There's a physical kingdom coming. There's going to be a king sit on the throne. He's going to do what Isaiah said he would do. He's going to right all the inequities on earth. He's going to take care of the poor. He's going to look after the widows. It's going to be heaven on earth. That's what they were hearing. That's what they were expecting because that's what they had been taught. That was the promises that had been given. That was the kingdom of heaven that John was talking about. That was the kingdom of heaven that they understood. And he wasn't telling them the church is coming. You got that? He didn't say there's this new thing. There's, God's going to establish the church here on earth. That wasn't part of it. They weren't thinking that. They didn't understand that at that particular time at all. Preaching the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven for Israel and of Israel. And when you read in the Gospels <coughs> and you're trying to interpret the Gospels, you need to understand the four Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're primarily... Jewish literature. They're for the Jews. It doesn't mean that we can't benefit from it, and they don't have some things to say to us, but they're primarily Jewish writings. And uh, you're going to see that, I hope, more clearly as we continue on tonight. So when he said, John the Baptist said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Behold, the Lamb of God is coming to take away the sin of the world. They, they're all thinking kingdom, kingdom, kingdom here on earth. That's what they saw. That's what they were looking for. That's what they were talking about. And he was, they understood when he said the Lamb of God is going to take away the sin of the world, they're talking Messiah, the anointed one that's been promised, the one that's going to sit on the throne of David. They had that clearly in their minds. Uh, then what happened? John the Baptist preaching and Jesus came, right? Luke chapter 1. Uh, Luke chapter 2, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and uh, so on. And we know that, that long story. I won't get into that tonight. 
And Jesus comes, and he's preaching. And he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, which is found where? Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. See, he preached almost as long as I do. You just didn't realize that. Took him three chapters to get it out. And I'm sure not everything he said is recorded there, right? But we, we have uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And when he's preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, this is an important question, who is he talking to? Jews or Gentiles? He's talking to the Jews. And he's giving them instructions for how they ought to live where? In the kingdom. When the king's on the throne and ruling and reigning, this is how you, you're supposed to live your life. Now, understand this. There, there's an application of those scriptures to our lives, right? But the primary interpretation of those passages is to Israel in the outlook of the kingdom that was going to be established and how to live within that kingdom. So Jesus comes preaching and he says things like, you are the salt of the earth. And we've taken that and we've said, oh, the church is the salt of the earth. Is that what Jesus said? Proper interpretation would say, who's the salt of the earth? It's Israel. It's Israel that he's talking about there. Now, because we've been grafted in, we talked about that over in Romans, we also have the privilege of being the salt of the earth. But in Matthew, when he's talking about you're the salt of the earth, he's talking to who? Not the church. Church isn't in view yet. He's talking to Israel for the proper interpretation of that, that passage. And so Jesus comes and he's preaching, not talking about the church, he's talking about Israel. As you continue on in Matthew, you'll find out that certain things take place. He calls the 12 disciples or the apostles, as we sometimes call them, and he leads them out and says, follow me, and he's teaching them. He's teaching them things about prayer and a whole lot of other things uh, about God and so on, all kinds of stuff. And again, we don't have time to go into all those things tonight because I'm trying to give you what? An overview of, of this. And then you come down to Matthew chapter 10. So just turn over to Matthew chapter 10 with me. Let's read the first few verses here, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. I still hear some pages rattling, and that's a good sound, because I like you to open your Bibles and use them. Matthew chapter 10 says in verse 1, And when he had called his twelve disciples to them, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot also betrayed him. These twelve, Jesus did what? He sent them out. Okay, giving you a commission here. I'm sending you out to do something for me. And he says here, do not go into the way of the, the who? Don't go to the Gentiles. Who's he talking to? Talking to the Jews. Said, what I've got to say, this isn't for the Gentiles. Don't, don't go tell them that. If anybody tells you they're operating today under the great commission of Matthew chapter 10, they're a liar. Unless they're only going to the Jews and they're forgetting about the Gentiles. If they forget about the Gentiles... Wait a minute, that means who? That means us. That means us. Because I would say the vast majority of us here tonight are not Jews, we're Gentiles. And he says, Jesus sends them out, he says, don't, don't go to the Gentiles. In other words, leave the Gentiles alone. You're not going to the Gentiles. Uh, let me come back here and just uh, find this, verse 5. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter a city of the Samaritans. Don't even go into one of their cities. What I'm, what I'm sending you out to do, what you're to accomplish, don't go to the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The commission that's given in Matthew chapter 10 is a Jewish commission. It's to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he says, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was he doing? He was offering Israel the kingdom that they'd been promised that they were looking for. 
and saying it's at hand. The Messiah is here. You can have it if you will believe and receive that kingdom. And of course, you know, the long of the short story is they rejected the Messiah. They rejected the kingdom and the offer that was being made. But I want you to understand the commission here isn't to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The commission at this point is go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, only preach to them. And every one of them, when those disciples heard that commission, they understood it, didn't they? They knew, hey, this is Jewish. We're, we're going to the Jews. We're going to take this message to the Jews. We're going to offer the kingdom. It's a completely Old Testament picture. That's what I want you to see. So up to Matthew 10 in the Gospels, it's the church isn't there. It's the Jews. It's the kingdom is being offered. And it's wrong to take this passage of Scripture, Matthew 10, and try to bring that over and say, oh, this is talking about the church, because it's not. You follow me? It's not talking about the church here. That's not our commission. If it is, our commission is pretty narrow. You're going to find out it's different than what he says here. It's a different perspective. And uh, what he was saying, go preach to the Jews, and they're out there preaching, preaching the kingdom. Matthew chapter 10, uh, let's just come down to verse 18 here for a moment. And he says, and you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the what? The Gentiles. So the Gentiles aren't totally left out of this, but when they're sent out with this commission, the first objective is to the Jews. Now, You'll read a statement over in Romans chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and, and, and elsewhere. It makes a statement there that caught my mind years ago, and it's this, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile, to the Jew first. The Word of God came first to who? To the Jew and then to Gentiles. And that's a principle that you follow through the Scriptures. It's to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles, to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. To properly interpret Scripture, you've got to keep that in mind. Even in the book of Romans, Paul will explain that more fully. And he, he tells them that you're sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel here. And when he gives them those instructions about, you know, you're to do this and that, and uh, as you go, preach and, and uh, heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead and cast out demons, is that for the church? But you've got a lot of preachers out there today say, oh, that's for us. No, it's not. That commission with those promises are to those people, the Jews, that were going out to preach to other Jews and make the offer of the kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and, and, and put your faith in the Lord and, 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 and the kingdom. Now, as you go along, time goes on, you're going to find out that the little people in Israel, <laughs> the ordinary people, they said, whoopee, this is great. The inequities are going to be set right. You're going to take care of our widows, all this. This is good news. But the big men in Israel, the ones that were in power and control, were they excited? No, they said, we don't know if we want anything to do with this. Who is this guy that's coming in here and talking about a kingdom, and he's going to be the king, and he's going to mess everything up for us? We're going to lose our power. And they began to oppose him. The scribes, the Pharisees, and other religious leaders in Israel began to oppose Jesus and what he was preaching and led the nation of Israel basically to reject what Jesus was saying. And it helps to explain a lot of things that happen as you go on here. He gives this commission, go out and tell, and then you're going to find him saying to, to, to people, he heals a leper and he'd say to the leper, what? Don't go tell anybody. Why? Because the offer of the kingdom had been rejected, and he's, he's withdrawing the offer. He's saying, don't, don't go. Don't go tell them anymore. Don't, don't do this. And, and he began to teach in parables. Why? Matthew chapter 13. He says, well, I'm, I'm going to teach you in parables because I don't want them to understand any longer. Why? Because they're rejecting me. You go over to John chapter 6. And by the way, when you read the Gospels, you need to understand something. They're not written in a chronological order of the events and how they took place. Or, you know, they'll pick one out of here and here and here sometimes. Some of them are a little bit chronological, but a lot of it's not. So uh, don't, don't try to read it that way. But in, in John chapter 6, the point comes where he'd been followed by thousands of people, and all of a sudden the crowds disappear, 
And he turns to his disciples and says, what? Will you go away also? Are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, Lord, to whom should we go? You, you got the answers. You're what we've been looking for. You're the Messiah. We, we've got nowhere else to go. If you're not it, we're lost. But the majority of the people had turned their backs on the Lord. Go to Matthew chapter 16 here. Matthew chapter 16. And verse 20, and it says, and he commanded his disciples, what? That they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. The Christ is who? He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one that had been promised. That's like withdrawing the what? The commission. Don't go telling this any longer. Things are going to change. And it tells us in verse 21 that it did change, and Jesus begins to tell them some things, fantastic things, but it wasn't what they wanted to hear. Because he says, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He wasn't going there for a party. What was he going there for, class? He was going there to die. He was going to Jerusalem. He says, when I go there, I must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be raised up on the third day. I think they kind of missed that because, you know, Peter steps up and says, no, Lord, it's not going to happen. Lord, we'll take up swords. That wouldn't have been a real good idea because we find out a little later on in the story that Peter was better, much better with a net than he was with a sword. You know, with a sword, he just cuts off ears and stuff like that. He's pretty good at catching fish with a net, but he wasn't great with the sword. Verses 21, 22, he, he says, or 22, he says, Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Peter's out of whack with where Jesus is going at this point. You ever been there? <laughs> Lord, no, we don't like this. We don't want to hear this. We, we don't like what you're saying. And uh, that's, that's where Peter was at that moment. In chapter 17, verse 22, just come down there for a moment, Matthew. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, and he just reiterates this message. He says, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly what? Sorrowful. Now, we're pretty excited about the fact that he died and rose again. They weren't looking forward to that because they didn't know all the outcomes that were going to come from that, but they, they, they didn't want Jesus uh, to die. But he's telling them again and again, I'm going to die, I've got to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised up. And they're not getting it. Well, except one of them was getting it. His name was, which of the disciples got it? was Judas. Because Judas, Judas says, look, I've been following this guy for three years. John the Baptist told me that, that he's the Messiah and he's going to set up his kingdom. And here's, here's Judas. And listen, he's not a mousy little rogue. He's, he's a well-respected member of this group of 12. They gave him the bag, which meant he's the treasure. They trusted him. And his thought is, I'm going to get to be treasure when he's in the kingdom. It's going to be very good for my pocketbook. He's a modern-day politician, way ahead of his time. And, and that's what he's thinking, and, and he had designs and all of that. But listen, if this guy's going to die, it's obvious we're not going to get the kingdom. Judas gets very disillusioned by all that, and as a result of that, he goes and talks with the chief priests and those guys that are against Jesus and want to find out how to get rid of him and says, hey, I'd like to help you. What's it worth to you? And for 30 pieces of silver, he sells out Jesus, right? And arranges for them to come and arrest him in the garden. And you know all that story and Good Friday and Easter and all that good stuff, and resurrection and wonderful stuff. Again, we're not going there. Back up for a moment before his crucifixion. The disciples are starting to get the idea of what's going on. At least some of them did. Do you remember Mary? Mary's listening to this. And, and she comes and she anoints his feet with what? With oil. Why? For 
the burial because she says, I understand what he's saying. He's going to die. Way back when Mary had been told about her son, you know, she's highly favored among women because her son's going to be the redeemer. It's prophesied back there that, that there's going to be a sword that pierces Mary's heart. Because a mother's heart gets pierced when her son gets crucified. And so it's all kind of coming to fruition. Listen, none of this caught God by surprise. This is part of his what? His great plan. He had a plan all through the Old Testament. I'm going to offer my kingdom to Israel. Israel rejects that plan, but God's not thwarted. He just keeps moving ahead with his plan. Part of that plan was to send his son to die on the cross, and come back one day to do what? To establish his kingdom. We studied the book of Revelation a while back, and we found out that near the end of the book of Revelation, what happens? Revelation 19, he comes back, married supper of the Lamb, sets up his kingdom upon the earth. I can't go along with those people. There's a lot of Christians, they think we're going to set up the kingdom and then Jesus come back. We're not going to do that. Jesus is going to set up his kingdom when he comes back upon planet Earth. <coughs> the disciples begin to wonder, well, Lord, if you're going to die, when, just when are you going to set up this kingdom? When are we going to get to sit with you on thrones and rule and reign? When's that going to happen? Go over to Matthew 24. And rest easy, I'm not going to preach through it tonight. But in Matthew chapter 24, you find that Jesus Christ begins to answer the question about the establishment of the kingdom. And just jump down to verse 3. He says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. I don't know if that means one by one, separately, or they came as a group privately, but they're coming, and this is on their minds about this kingdom. Why? Because they were Jews. They've been looking for a physical kingdom to come and be established. And they said, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Lord, when's all this going to be fulfilled? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of terrible things. There's going to be time of trouble. Israel's going to be in a bad way through all of this stuff. In verses 5 through 9, he, he sort of lays out wars, rumors of wars. Verse 7, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these things are what? Just the beginning of sorrows. And we saw those sorrows poured out in the book of Revelation, in the, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the vile or bold judgments that are poured out there in the book of Revelation. Verse 9, then they will deliver you. Who's you? It's the Jew. It's Israel. Why? Because this is a Jewish book. They're going to deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and, and you will be hated by all nations. What do we call that? Anti-Semitism, which, by the way, is on rise everywheres. Everywheres. Montreal rising. In Ottawa, anti-Semitism is on the rise today. Various places around the world, especially where? Middle East. <laughs> the Arabs hate the Jews. And it's, it's not just them, but it's spreading. And it's, it's, I think it's being set up for the last days. He said, it's, you think it's bad now? It's going to get to be a whole lot worse than it is today. You're going to be hated of all nations. But remember, it's all going to be okay in the end. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm coming back. I will set up my kingdom. And it'll be Jewish in nature. Yes, I think we're going to be a part of it. But Jewish in nature, that kingdom that he establishes. I, I'm not going to take the time to read verse 11, verse 15. Uh, he talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And I know there's a, a, a short interpretation of who that abomination of desolation was. I think it was Atias, Atiochus Epiphanes, the Greek guy that came in and did terrible things in the temple and so on. It's not because 
Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, what's he telling us? When you see it, it hasn't happened yet. It's, it's in the future. And the, the beast, the Antichrist, all that business we studied about in Revelation is what you're, you're reading about when we read this. And you see the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoever reads this, let him understand. And then verse uh, 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. If you're in Judea, you're in Jerusalem, and you see this stuff starting to take place, where should you go? You better get out of there. You better go into the mountains. You need to go into hiding. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Uh, you better run. You better go, go get out of there as far as you can because it's going to be tough days for the people of Israel during those days. Down to verse uh, 27. Let's see here. He says, For as the lightning comes out of the east and flashes to the west, so, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. What's he saying? There's going to be a massacre. There's going to be a lot of death, destruction. And just like when you see the wild birds gathering around, you know there's a dead animal there somewhere. It's going to be everywhere in Israel in that days. When what? When the Son of Man, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, returns. Uh, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And I, I wouldn't say that I can be absolutely dogmatic about this, but my understanding of this is that when Jesus begins to come back, I think the earth is going to see a glow in the heavens as his glory comes. I, I don't think at this, this point when he comes, right, actual second coming, that it's bang and he's here. I think we're going to see him coming, and the men on earth that are anti-God, the forces of Antichrist, are going to have time to amass their forces in Israel to say, we're not letting them come back. That's why you're going to have that massive battle of Armageddon, because they will see him descending and descending and coming and coming closer and coming closer as he comes to the earth, and then his feet, what? They touch down on the Mount of Olives that split asunder. The great battle takes place. He defeats the nations of the world. He judges the nations, and he sets up his kingdom. It's all about what? It's all about the kingdom. It's all about Jesus, his kingdom that he's going to establish. And the good news for the Jew and the good news for us is that God still has the plan. He's going to fulfill it. He's good for his word. We can trust him. Matthew 28, got to finish this off. Very familiar verses to you. Just come down to verses 18 and 19. 20. Jesus has been crucified. He's risen again. He's been seen of many, right? So they got full proof. And, and he's been instructing them, I'm, I'm going to go away, and the Holy Spirit's going to come and help you, and, but I will come back again, right? And I'm going to build a, a place for you, John 14. And when I get it ready, I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself, and where I am there will you be also. And that's how all that kind of fits in there. And, and so we get that. And then in verse 9, 18, Jesus, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. Now, dunamis exousia. I've got the authority. I've got ability here. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Oh, I like that. He doesn't say, <clears throat> go, don't go to the Gentiles here, right? He doesn't say, don't, go, don't enter into any city of Samaritans here. Don't go to the city of Fredericton. Don't go to the city of Toronto. Just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's not what he's saying. The commission has changed for you and I. The commission now is... Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's the commission? 
worldwide in scope. God's desire is to reach out and get this to every last tongue and tribe and race of people upon planet Earth so they can have the message, go and make disciples, fully developed followers of Jesus Christ. What's, everybody says every once in a while, what's your vision? What's, what's your vision for Devon Park Baptist? My vision is make disciples. My vision is to preach the gospel and see people saved and matured in Christ and grow up. That's what these Sunday night sessions have been about, right? It's to mature you, grow you up, help you to understand the Bible, to get you reading your Bible for yourself, studying your Bible for yourself, growing in Christ, becoming a disciple of the Lord, going back out and sharing the message with the world. Whether it's out on the street, as some of the guys are doing on Thursday night, or over the backyard fence, or having a neighbor in for a meal, or talking with a, a, a lady like my wife's been doing for the the, the last few days, a, a lady who's really struggling and wrestling with, with our enemy, Satan, and knows that. And, and just, I, I'd encourage you, pray for this lady. Pray for Mary as she's trying to answer her questions. Uh, the other night she was up until 2.30 or 3.30 in the morning just trying to answer questions for this lady. She's hungry, but Satan's fighting for her soul. And, and we, need, we need, listen, what we need is a church is all of us to understand that commission. Not Matthew 10, but Matthew 28 is for us. As disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, to go out into all the world. You have a responsibility where you work, with the people you work with, with the neighborhood in which you live, to be making disciples, to be sharing, to be his witnesses. When we get into the book of Acts, which we'll do, Lord willing, next Sunday night, you're going to find out that he's, he's, he's going to tell us there that ye shall be my witnesses. Not just in Judea, not just in Jerusalem here in Judea and Samaria, but where? Unto the uttermost ends of the earth. That's why we support missionaries. That's why we have missions conferences and things like that to challenge you and to stir you up and to fire you up and, and, and to give and pray and if God calls you to go with this glorious message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, finish this. What you need to understand, understand your Bible, is basically when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the context is Jewish, right? Until the point where Christ is crucified, buried, risen again, because he said, this new covenant I'm making with you, establishing it with what? The shedding of his blood. And that is the point where what's introduced? The church. The church at that point. And it's after that point that he gives what? This commission. Go and make disciples. Go and baptize. Go and win the lost. By the way, just to encourage you, had our, our first new members in, in baptismal class this morning. We had eight in that class. What a blessing and encouragement it was to my heart just to, to be able to spend time and, and, and begin to go through the gospel and baptism and the Lord's Supper and our doctrinal statement and what the church is about and all of that stuff with them. Pray for these people that they'll, they'll get it in their hearts and their lives and their lives will be changed by it. Anyway, we're done.